Well, good morning, everyone. It is an absolute joy to be with you and good to see more people here this time. Last time I was here a year ago, it was uh, COVID was keeping all of you on Zoom, if not in person. So I'm glad you're here. It's good to see you. There's so much easier to preach to people than views. So I'm just thankful for that. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Judges. The book of Judges and chapter 18. On Friday mornings, it's been my privilege to teach a Bible class. So we've been for two years, and we've been going through different books of the Bible, and right now we're in the book of Judges. And one of the things that an old evangelist said many years ago, as he was uh, training young men how to be effective evangelists, and so what he would do is give them a chapter of the Bible, and he'd say, now find a gospel message in that chapter. And then he went another chapter and he said, now find a gospel message in that. And they weren't obvious ones. So as I read this, we're going to be looking at the gospel this morning. And it may not be obvious to you. And this way, but you see the gospel here. So no, Judges 18. And I'm going to read uh, just a, a few verses. Verse 7 to begin with, please. Judges 18 and verse 7. It says, Then the five men departed and came to Laish. And saw the people that were therein, how they dwelt careless after the manner of the Zidonians, quiet and secure, and there was no magistrate in the land that might put shame in anything. And they were far from the Zidonians and had no business with any. And then, please, same chapter, verse 27 and verse 28. And they took the things which Micah had made and the priests which he had, and came unto Laish, unto a people that were at quiet and secure, and they smote them with the edge of the sword, and burnt the city with fire, and there was no deliverer, because it was far from Zidon, and they had no business with any man, and there was in the valley that lies by Rehob, and they built a city and dwelt therein. Now, if you're going to a ribbon or a marker or some piece of paper, stick it in your Bible in chapter 18, where we are. We're going to be coming back there, but I need to read one more passage from the book of James, please. James in chapter 1. James chapter 1. I want to read verse 15 through 17. It says, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. In James 1 15, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not bear, my beloved brethren, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, by the shadow of turning. And again, God will bless that reading of his word and keep your living in James gone as well, because we want to be going back and forth between the two. God will bless the reading of his word to us this morning. Now, I want to just say this at the beginning of this, I want to commend you uh, that you work about the gospel. I, I'm so thankful for that. I, uh, the way you run around the universe, who I love dearly, he said that an assembly is a three legged stool. And he said, if any one of those legs are missing, what happens if you've got a three legged stool and you lose a leg? You are in a very precarious position, aren't you? And he said that the assembly, uh, there are three legs. One is uh, a leg that we talk about ministry to the heart of God in worship. That's part of the reason an assembly exists. We just did that this morning. We had a wonderful time ministering to the heart of God that which throws him. That's his son. We did that this morning. Worship. The other is ministering to one another in edification and body life, right? We need that too. We need that for you know, kind of building one another up. So that's that ministry, uh, that second leg. And then the final leg is ministering to a lost and dying world. And that's the gospel. And I would suggest to you that many assemblies have lost that leg. They've lost the gospel. They've lost the burden for the gospel. And we need to get it back. So I, I would commend you for your concern. Now, I want to say again, go back to the Judges 18. 
and we don't have to understand all the background to this story. Uh, just simply this, that uh, the people of Laos were in the land of Canaan. And if you remember anything about the Bible, you realize that the Canaanites were very wicked. Now, God was very patient. In fact, he said to Abraham that the iniquity of the Amorites, the people of the land of Canaan, wasn't yet full. And he was going to give them time for their wickedness to ripen to a full level, and then he was going to judge them. Okay, And it was going to take 400 years. So God patiently waited 400 years, allowing their sin to reach its peak before judgment would fall, and God would move the Israelites to bring judgment on these, these people of the land of Canaan. And of course, you say, well, how, how is that good news? Well, in one sense, what it, what it tells us is this. God, by this very nature, is infinitely holy. And we sometimes forget that. And in this holiness, he hates sin with a passionate nature because he sees what it does to the human race and sees how devastating it is and how it wrecks lives and wrecks families and wrecks countries and it just causes devastation. He hates sin. And in this holy nature, we must judge sin. He wouldn't be a just God if he just ignored sin, right? He would be, he would be unjust to allow it to continue. So in his holiness, he, he, he must be over sin. Now, God had given a great witness to these nations in what he did with the nation of Israel, in bringing them out of the land of Egypt and all the miracles. And, and some of the people of the land of Canaan remembered that, heard that, and turned to the Lord. One of them was a prostitute called Rahab the Harlot. You see, so God's grace was available even for the people of this land. And he had given a great testimony to his greatness. So they all knew about that. But they didn't do anything about it. They carried on in their sin and wickedness. So I want us to just think about the people of Laish. We saw in, in verse 27 that uh, they're about to be judged. But uh, it, it, it tells us what was going to happen, what was about to fall at Pandem. Uh, and it tells us, I'll just read again, verse 27 they took the things which Micah had made and the things which he had, and it came to Laish to a people that were uh, quiet and secure, and they smote them with the edge of the sword and burnt the city of fire, and there was no deliverance. I want just to get this idea that those people and God's judgment is about to fall upon them. But they're oblivious. They don't realize. They don't realize how close they are to the judgment of God. And I wonder if the people in this country realize. Do you realize how close God's judgment is? The Bible actually says, if you're not a Christian this morning, if you haven't trusted in the Lord Jesus, the Bible says about you that the wrath of God abides on you. It's like it's hanging over your head, just moving into balance. That's how close you are to the judgment of God. And so when people, and they have no idea that, that they're about to be wiped out, they don't get it. They're, they're not, a, not aware of it. So what is verse 7, what they were like? What, what was their condition? Even though judgment is about to fall, what was their condition? Well, the first thing we learn is that they were a careless people. Verse 7 says, five men departed, came to Laish, and saw the people of the area, how they dwelt careless. Careless people. It sounded a lot like North America right now, doesn't it? Are careless people. Just people under the judgment of God, his wrath is about to burst on them, and there, well, all they can think about is the next episode of their favorite sermon. Careless. Right, just going about life as if no anxiety about eternity, no concern about their eternal destiny, just carelessness everywhere. And, and I have to say this that. Part of my job as a gospel teacher 
is to get you to realize you shouldn't be anxious about your eternal destiny. You shouldn't care about your soul. You shouldn't care about what's going to happen to you one second after death. You should be concerned. And to be careless is a bad place to be in. And sadly, our culture has lots of ways to, to continue to keep you in that drug state of carelessness. Uh, and the whole idea of entertainment, amusements, right? Where, where people that are amusing ourselves to death, what does amusement mean? Well, amusement means, means more thinking, ah, means no. It means more thinking. Uh, this is our culture, the reason there's no anxiety about the soul is because you're not thinking. And the reason you're not thinking is because you're being drugged by the media. And by the way, behind the media is the God of this world, who it says has blinded the minds of those that believe not. And so you're in this dulled state that leaves you careless, no sense of anxiety about your soul or your eternal destiny, and careless. And that's what a careless people not conscious of the fact that judgment was about to fall. And it says, and I don't think they care, it says, after the manner of Zygons, it's quiet and secure. By the way, if you want to know what the Zygons were like, um, one of the most notorious people in the Bible was a Zygonian. Her name was Jezebel. Remember the story of Jezebel? Her dad, who was one of the kings of the Zidonians, and a, and a high priest of the Zidonian religion, worship the Bill. And so the Zidonians were pretty wicked. Incredibly wicked people. Careless after the manner of the Zidonians, and then this quiet and secure. It almost seems like it's a tranquil scene. You know, when you think of quiet and secure, that sounds pretty nice, doesn't it? Uh, I remember the first time we came to America. Uh, I have to say, all I'd ever seen of this country was what I'd seen on TV. And as an unsaved uh, person in my youth, I used to watch a lot of American detective shows. And the first thing out of America is that she would get shot on the street corner every day. It's kind of like, and so we a bit nervous coming to this country because all we've ever seen. This coach jack and this base, you know, it kind of gives me your age, right? Starts to approach. I said, I'm an agent, really. I really haven't known that. But that's all we watch. We watch that kind of stuff. And, and so you're petrified coming to this country. We end up in Wisconsin. Where nobody locks their doors, nobody locks their cars. Where you go to a restaurant and there's a sign on the wall that says, We encourage our patrons, patrons to give thanks to God for their food. And I thought, I'd be lied to. <laughs> I'd be deceived. This is not like it was quiet and peaceful. But you know what? The people there in rural Wisconsin, we found as we went talking to souls, they were just as lost as people in those cop shows. Just as lost, even though it was quiet and peaceful. Because there's a deceptive peace. Let, let people, everything seems peaceful and tranquil and quiet in life, and yet God's judgment is still waiting to pounce, and everything can be as, as cool as the breeze in my life. But you know, none of us can control our next heart when we can wait. One second after death, that person will face the terror of eternity in the lake of fire. And yet, it's all peaceful, quiet, secure, seemingly, but it's all a deception. You see, the Bible says, there is no peace, saith my God, for the wicked. And it says it twice, and it should be better the first time. It says it in Isaiah 38, and it says it again in Isaiah 57. There is no peace, saith my God, for the wicked. Now, you might be deceived to think everything's fine, and everything's cozy, and everything's quiet, and everything's secure, but it's a deception. Because if you don't know Christ is your Savior, you're not safe. You're not secure. And it's not going to be quiet for you. You're going to spend an eternity in a place 
of separation from God, a place of conscious torment for all eternity. There are all people who's wailing, wailing, and gnashing teeth. And so, there's a for a careless people, there's this this quietness, this quiet deception. They're, they're really a deceived people. And unless we feel uh, too sorry for them, they were a wicked people. I need to notice it says, uh, again, there is no magistrate in the land that might put them to shame in anything. And so they're, they're, they're basically lawless. There's no magistrate that would shame them in their behavior, that would tell them what they're doing is wrong. And, and so it was a lawless society and a shameless society. I find that interesting, isn't it? Increasingly, our culture is a shameless society. There's no shame anymore. You know, I can remember that um, if somebody had a, a child out of wedlock, there was a great shame attached to it in bad and by. There was a scandal. Actually, if somebody got divorced. It, it was a scandal. And that shows how old I am. But I remember those days. Right? Those things were absolutely scandalous and there was a shame about them. But now, instead of shame about sin, you know what society says? We're proud of it. And they march down the streets and they proclaim to the world, I am absolutely proud of my conversion. Is that where we're at? Just like the Zygonians. Shameless. And, and unfortunately, there's no magistrate that will do what the Bible says shouldn't be done to these kind of people. So the Bible says it's sin. The Bible says actually people conducting themselves in that way in the Old Testament were to be stoned to death. And the magistrates were to witness against them. Right? But now, no shame. And so this is a, a shameless society. They're, they're involved in utter wickedness, and they're not even ashamed. Their, their consciences are so seared and so dulled that they can sin and, and, and actually boast about it. No shame. And the, the greatest tragedy about this particular chapter is, yes, judgment is about to fall, but verse 28 says this, and there is no deliverer. That's tragic, isn't it? Isn't it tragic to be, to be under the judgment of God, to, to be just seconds away from the sword of eternal justice and having no hope of anybody delivering you. But that's why we're here this morning. Because the one thing that I can tell you that's different in the story is that for you, even if up to now you've been careless about your sin, even if up to now you've been shameless about your sin, I can tell you that I'm here with a message of hope. And that message of hope centers on a deliverer. There is a deliverer. How do I know that? Because he delivered me from my sin and my rebellion and my debauchery. He saved me and he could save you from hell and from judgment. How's God going to do this? How is he going to do this? How do they provide this deliverer? Let's go now to James. Keep in mind what we just seen in Judges. That passage now in James chapter 1. And, and, and we see verse 15, when verse 15 says it brings forth sin, and sin when it's finished brings forth death. But let me just kind of emphasize this again, please. Sin when it's finished brings forth death. This is a divine principle that sin, when it's finished, 
brings forth death. Now, let me explain what I mean by sin when it's finished brings forth death. See, the interesting thing is that most of us, when we sin, never think about sin when it's finished. We always think of it at the beginning. And at the beginning, it always looks attractive. If it didn't look attractive, it would have no appeal to it, would it? Sin by its very nature is attractive, isn't it? And so let me give you an example of sin from the Bible itself of, of how attractive sin looks. Actually, the Bible talks about the pleasures of sin, and then it says for a season. It's only short term, but the consequences are long term, right? But in the short term, pleasure for a season. Right? So there's pleasure in connected with sin. And it always looks good at the beginning. So we go back to the beginning, go back to the Garden of Eden. And, and uh, there, there was fruit on the tree. I'm not going to say what kind of fruit it was, because the Bible doesn't say what kind of fruit, but I don't know this, that it looked good. Uh, you said it looks good to me. I'm sure it looked good. Now, for me, it have to be wrapped in a pie for me to be happy to appeal. But nevertheless, it, it, it did look to be appealing. It looks good. And there is kind of promise connected with it. It said so if you eat it, it's going to make you wise. But who doesn't want to be wise? But then it said that if you eat it, you're going to be like God. Wow, that sounds appealing, doesn't it? And so this, this fruit it looks good, it, it has a good appeal connected with it, and I'm sure it probably tasted good. So it's fine. Right? Everything about it says good, 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 except God says not good. God says the day we eat thereof, we will surely die. Now, what's interesting is Adam and Eve didn't chew over and die that day, did they? So the Bible is not true. No, it is true. But you see, what happened is this that we think of death for just taking the last breath. But that's not how the Bible defines death. Death means separation. And there's three stages to it. The first stage is when, when we sin, we are separated from God. That's spiritual death. That's the most significant one, in a sense. Everything else comes out of that. And so, so that day, prior to them eating that fruit and acting in rebellion and direct disobedience against the commands of God, prior to that, they enjoyed intimate communion with God every single day. Yeah, the intimacy with God is a wonderful relationship. But the minute they eat that fruit, they die spiritually. Something inside of them died, and instead of looking forward to meeting with God and walking with God, they went from him. That interesting. There was a big fact of that intimate relationship with God. And sin always does that. It always breaks that intimacy of fellowship with God and communion with God. It's a terrible thing. We don't enjoy him anymore. We want to hide from him because we're guilty and we know it. And so it's a terrible thing. Well, then eventually, we get to Genesis chapter 5, and there's a refrain run through that chapter about Adam and all his descendants, and it says this, and he died, 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 just keep going. Because sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. So that's physical death. There's spiritual death, there's physical death, and then there's a third aspect to death. And that is, if that person that dies, dies without restoring that communion with God before they die, without getting right with God, it means they will be forever separated from God for all the eternity in a place without hope. And so, Sin is finished. And there's many other examples. The Bible says to by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men that all of sin. And so clearly there's this idea that death always brings separation. Separation spiritually uh, from God, 
separate them physically. Uh, when the body separates from the soul and spirit, the body goes into the grave, soul and spirit, I he goes to a place of eternal punishment, or he goes to uh, be with God. If that person is reconciling themselves to God, and then that eternal separation. Some other examples of sin, what we did at the beginning, and what all this bringing forth death. Remember the story of David and Bathsheba? Anybody think that Bathsheba was a good looking woman? I mean, it doesn't describe her in the text, but David had lots of wives. Like a woman, maybe the woman, he's got his own personal harem, really, right? And when he sees this woman, I bet she looked gorgeous. Absolutely beautiful. And it's okay. Probably she was married to somebody else. And as it happens, she got pregnant and David tried the best cover up in history. And it didn't work. So a lot of dying occurred because of sin, but the day we died. And that David's son Ammon died, and David's son Absalom died, and David lost his kingdom, and David lost his respect, and, and it was just a disaster. And you asked David, and you could say to him, I want to interview him, was it worth it, David? Like, how did it go, this sin thing? Did it work out? You ask anybody who has fallen into sin, and the repercussions and the consequences, was it worth it? Or I'll say the same thing, you know, it was a disaster. You see, sin, when it's finished, what's the deception? Deception is losing you to the good and get a lot of it. That's the deception. Sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. None of these stories happen when they all live happily ever after. It was a miserable. miserable. See, the Bible says sin is slavery. It's enslaving. It's bondage. It's hard bondage. It looks good. And so James says, he says, get this right. I believe it. Sin when it's finished brings forth death. You are not all my beloved bread. Get it right. Understand this. Sin when it's finished always brings forth death. Don't, don't, don't be deceived. Sin when it's finished brings forth death. Then he says, so, so get this right. Don't err, my beloved brethren. And then it's almost like the truth is true and says something completely radical here in verse 17. He says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no very goodness, neither shadow of returning. And you ask yourself, What's this got to do with anything he's been saying? Well, how does God deal with this problem of man separated from God because of sin? How, what's his solution? How are you going to deal with this? But he said, well, I've got a solution. I'm going to send a gift into the midst of this mess. And what a gift it was. See, God so loved the world. In all of its rebellious degradation, even though he hates the sin, he loves the sin. And he wants him back. He wants a relationship with him, with you. He wants a relationship. So how do we deal with that? Well, he sent his son. God so loved the world that he gave his own begotten son. The greatest gift that he could give was his perfect, holy, righteous son. Who would come into this world and who would be the only person who didn't sin. Lived the perfect life. In fact, the Bible says he knew no sin, he did no sin, neither was any guile found in his mouth. This was the perfect man. Mark, the perfect man, the Bible says, well, I'll tell you the things on the perfect man that has grace this earth. But this is the Lord Jesus. And yet, the interesting thing is, we said that sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. And yet, there's this dilemma. He is the only sinless person that ever lived. But when we think about Jesus, what do we think about? Let's think about he died. Well, why did he die if he was sinless? If sin, when it's finished, brings forth death, and yet made this man who all sin, and yet he did that, you have to ask yourself, why? Isn't this kind of breaking the whole thing? You know, it's this, I mean, you said sin, when it's finished, you didn't sin. How did you die? Well, it was because of sin. 
are his words. You see, when we said that someone is finished, brings forth death. If you want to know what sin when it's finished looks like, I want to take you to a place called Calvary. I want you to, want you to look at somebody who he, he says his, his face was marred by an enemy. Well, is that because they are just given a good beating? There's a lot of people whose countenance is being hard because of the beating. The reason that Jesus' face was marred by an enemy is that he went through the wrath of God for sin. Not for this. He's sinless. He's spotless. He's, he's not just sinless. He's infinitely holy. And yet, as our substitute, he bore in his own body on that tree our sin. Your sin. My sin. It was like this. That God laid in Jesus the sin of the world. And then punish him as if he had he was guilty of every one of them, as if he committed them. And God's holy wrath against sin was poured out on his son on that cross at Calvary. You want to know what sin when it finished looked like? Look at heaven. Look at Calvary. Look at that man, my old God, my old man. So why? Why is this happening? Because God wants to forgive. He, he, he wants to show mercy to the people who are under judgment that deserve death and deserve hell. He wants to do that. But he can't just pretend it didn't happen. He can't just look in the way and say, I know you're a scoundrel, but you can come into my heaven. He can't do that because, because people will be able to turn around and accuse him of being unrighteous. God, how did that guy get into heaven? I knew about him. He's a blind scoundrel. How did how we ever let him in? God can say, I can let him in because his sin was taken care of. It was dealt with. He was punished. Everything that man ever did was punished. But it was punished in the substitute of God Jesus. There are our sin in his own God, not naturally. And so God is able to allow us to be forgiven, bring us back into that intimate relationship with him. We can still retain his justice, his righteousness and holiness, because nobody can say that sin wasn't paid for, because Jesus paid it all. All to him I will. Sin had left that crimson stain. He washed it without a snow. You see, you see the Lord Jesus bear our sin in his own God and true. And so unlike the people of Laish who had no deliverer, I'm here this morning to tell you there is a deliverer. That deliverer is Jesus Christ. He loved you enough to die and take the penalty that you deserve. But listen, you can no longer be careless about your sin. You have to realize how serious it is. You shouldn't be anxious about your soul. Because either he pays the penalty or you pay the penalty. It must be paid. So you can either let him pay it as less substitute and trust in his finished work, or you can pay yourself in hell for all eternity. We can't afford to be careless. And you can't allow, to, uh, allow yourself to be deceived into, into this quiet state of security if you don't have a secure savior. You know, it's wonderful. I can tell you without hesitation, not because I'm a good person, I say, well, not but I know without a shadow of doubt that if I die, I will go to heaven. I have absolute security and peace and quietness in my soul. And it's not a deceptive one. Because the Bible says, whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have present possession, everlasting life. So, please don't be careless about your soul. Please don't have this deceptive sense of quiet and peace. Oh, I live in a 
restore to, to recognize what is what you want. And in that point, we are free to be able to deliver. These people are going to live like a long time. These people are rich, they're too late for them. Judgment felt there's no good of another felt. But they're here to introduce you to the only one who can help you. You can't help yourself if you're a sinner. So even when you try and do good things as hard as preferred to end them, you can't do anything to save yourself. You need a complete deliverer. And God has provided such deliverer. And by the way, God showed us that he accepted the his son is our substitute. And I'll show it. It says that on the third day he rose in front of the grave. To say that, you see, if sin have not been paid for, he saved in the grave. Because it says the age of sin is death, and he saved the dead, he saved the dead, and he's alive. Jesus is alive because sin has been dealt with by Calvary. So, can I urge you this morning, if you've never closed me, in the author of the deliverer of the savior to save you from sin and death and hell. I did it until the Lord Jesus. He's the only way you can save. And you know the amazing thing is, you see, if they could just had somebody they could call upon, if they had somebody they could, they could just call out to and say, help this, or there'd be somebody there to come to their aid, there's nobody. But here's a great message this morning. The Bible says this, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Isn't that beautiful? All you've got to do, for the very life of your people, if you've never done it before, is simply say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I deserve judgment. I know I do, but I need to be saved. Lord, save me. You will do it. It says, the other comes to them. No matter how bad, you might have been this religion of Jezebel. It says, whoever comes to him through the three lines, cast them out. <laughs> he will receive you. He will save you. He will cleanse you from your sin, give you a new star, a new beginning, a new hope, a new life, a glorious future, and a hope. So will you close in on the offer of salvation? Because it might not be available much longer. The reason I say that is, we're not going to the next breath. This is not something to put off. You may not have tomorrow. And many people went to bed at night thinking they'd wake up in the morning and they didn't. Well, they did. They woke up in the morning. So can I urge you, please, this is serious. We're not playing games here. This is the most serious thing you can ever do, which is closing the art of salvation. And for those of us that are saved, when we know it, we know where we're going. Can I urge you to flee from sin as well? Because the long sea sin when it's finished. Look at Calvary. See, every sin was paid for on Calvary. Only the last one sins were committed before we were saved, but during the ones after, we were all to be mind of God when we died on the cross. So please, don't add anything to this. Let's flee from sin. Let's live the holy lives. And let's tell the world there's hope. Yes, there's yes, one who delivers. He's mighty to deliver, and we know it because it's one of the us. We are the introducers to him. And God help us in these thoughts. Let's pray. Father, we pray because what we are this morning, we've never ever trusted the Lord Jesus. And even being in a meeting like this, maybe even the Christian people, since not guaranteeing it doesn't come by natural birth. But by super birth. So that is there's one more of us never ever close with this offer of salvation, this full and free offer. Because whatever will call in the name of the world, but they might do it this morning. And my father, the voice of us like no earth is sure for the Lord of heaven. But we can't be deliberate that the same place that is our our beloved is our friend. Oh, Lord, help us to remember our sin when it's finished. And to flee from it, to live lives of 
of most holiness. So Lord Jesus, since we do this, we ask again this precious word in the Thank <laughs> you. 